Okay. Anybody's attempt this paper? No. Couldn't attempt it, right? Okay. Now it says determine the acceleration of the ball as it rolls down the ramp. So we gotta find the acceleration here. The first point is zero and zero. And then you see at this point, it is like, so if this is 12, this is 13. So 12.2468, 12.8. So 12.8 and the time is 1.5. So 12.8 minus zero divided by, um, Final my essential divided by time is 1.5. So that would be the acceleration. So wait a second, please. So it is 8.5 meters per second square. No. Okay. The ball starts, yes. For this question, we won't do the acceleration for the line which it is going down. Because it says it goes down a ramp onto a horizontal surface. Now it was in horizontal surface here. This means this is horizontal surface, just friction is there now. So speed is reducing. Not ramp has finished at this point. Okay. So when you roll down, speed increases, right? Yes, because and then it was. So like this, yes. We have to find the acceleration of the ball. It's rolling down the ramp. That's going down. Yes. yes. So there is a considered correct. Eight point five three. Yes. So ramp is like this, Sadia. So when the ball is going down, it is increasing speed, and then it becomes smooth. Because now the flat, it is flat. And if it is rough, now the switch speed will decrease. So for this section, the graph looks like this. For this section, it looks like this. And for this section, it looks like this. Okay. Do you understand? Yes. The ball starts from rest at the top of the ramp. Show that the length of the ramp is this. So we know that area under the graph is the length, so it's 1.5. And that's 12.8, so we going, that's a triangle, right? So half time, 12.8 uh, times 1.5. So that is 9.6 meters shown. So area under the graph of the ramp section. So you have to understand this. Now, pretty cool. And now let's go forward. So, state Hooke's law. Hooke's law is, it means force is directly proportional to extension unless limit of proportionality has not reached. Now, state the relationship between mass of baby and the force exerted in spring due to the baby. Oh, <laughs> there is a baby actually. Okay. So relationship between mass and the force exerted. Okay. So the relationship is that his weight, which is the force, is equal to mass times acceleration due to gravity. You can also write, uh, you can also write mg. Okay. Now reading on the spring balance is eight. Determine the force. So it is going to be eight times 10. So that's going to be 80 Newtons. 
because we use W equals to MK, by the way. Now, limit of proportionality of the spring is 175 newtons. Sketch extension load graph must be on. So your line will start from the origin. It will go straight, right, till uh, 175. And then the line is going to bend like this. Okay. Why it is going up? Because I've always told you the line bends towards the extension with the extension on the y axis. If the same was given like this, right? There was force here and extension. Then you would make it like this and then bend it towards the extension. All right. All right. The baby is carried from ground floor to bedroom. The vertical height of the bedroom above the ground is 3.5. Calculate the change in gravitational potential energy of baby when it is carried from. Okay. So GPE is equal to MGH. The mass was 80. This is 10. And the height is 3.5. Sorry, the mass was 8. That's going to be 280 joules. Let's write it down. Okay, that's the end. That's pretty simple. Okay, um, so how is puddle of water changes on a warm, windy day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, after three hours. So it is due to evaporation okay so <clears throat> the most energetic water molecules leave the surface of the puddle over time, okay? So this is the process. State one change in the weather that would cause the volume water puddle to decrease more slowly. So if it becomes more humid because humidity causes reduction in rate of evaporation. And the reason behind that is because there is already water content in air. So there's already too much water content in air, then it means that more water content will have difficulty to go, right? Now, explain in terms of molecules, how sweating helps cool your body. Okay, so what are we going to say? Due to evaporation, most energetic molecules leave the surface. For three months, I'm right. Then what happens? They take heat energy along, reducing the average, sorry, can I get here? Reducing average kinetic energy of the rest, which causes decrease in 
temperature, or you could say cause a spool. Right? That's very simple. If you have any questions, please let me know. Now, sample of sand has a volume of this, density of this, heat capacity. Calculate the mass. Okay. Density equals to mass over volume. The density is 1900 times volume is 0 0.050 equals mass. That's going to be 95 kilograms. Calculate the thermal capacity of sample of the sand. Thermal capacity. Now you see heat capacity is, uh, thermal capacity is a Q equals to C delta theta, right? And heat capacity, specific heat capacity is C, M, C delta. You know what is the difference between two? There's an M, there's not an M, right? Very clever people, okay? Let me tell you what, what's there. So if you see that the heat capacity is just this, thermal capacity is this. So what is the difference between them? The thermal capacity is equal to heat capacity over mass. So we have the heat capacity right here. We just want to divide it by this. So 1500 divided by 95. So 15.8 joules per degree Celsius. Okay. Just like that. Right. Or did I make some? I, I, I made a mistake. Sorry. It's basically like you see Q upon delta theta is here, Q upon delta theta is here. It means heat capacity is the thermal capacity divided by mass. So thermal capacity is heat capacity times mass. So 1500 times 95. Sorry, you got it wrong. Times 95. I was like, why is it so small? So basically, you can write it as 1, 4, 3, 0, 0, 0. Joules per degree Celsius. Now, the initial temperature of the sand is seven, and the sand is heated using electrical heater. The power of the heating element is 50. Calculate time taken to increase the temperature to 19. Okay, so what you want to do, we don't have the mass, right? We do have the mass, right? So you can write Q equals to MC delta theta. Uh, energy is power into time. And the mass is 95, heat capacity is 1500, and the change in uh, temperature is 19 minus 7. Um, we also have the power, right? So we're going to, let's say, let's, let me write power into time so you don't forget. And power here is 50. Okay. So what you do? 95 times 1500 times 19 minus 7 divided by 50. So that's 34200. 34200 seconds. Okay. And that's 
a lot, by the way. But, uh, let's see. I don't know. Now, in some countries, the soil is too cold for plants to grow well. In these countries, plants are grown in plastic pots and kept inside. The pots containing soil are placed on sand. The sand is heated using an electrical heater. Describe in terms of molecule how thermal energy is transferred heated sand to base to plastic pot through the heating element of the sand. Okay. Okay, so basically, heat is transferred through vibrations of molecules as temperature increases. Because this is not a metal, so it does not have free electrons. This process is called conduction. So it has to be only conduction, by the way. The heating element in figure 4.1 remains switched on. The temperature of the sand remains constant at a value above room temperature. Okay, why the temperature of the sand remains constant? Okay, okay. So this means that it remains constant as the energy Temperature of the sand remains constant. Okay, so energy from the heater going into the sand is equal to energy lost by sand to surroundings. That's why, all right? So if the energy that's coming in is equal to that's going out, so the temperature isn't, isn't going to change, okay? That's fine. Do you have any questions? Please let me know. Now on to the next one. There's a clock, there's a mirror, the drawn ray of light reflected into this. So from the, any point, okay? So choose a point, so let me show you. So let's pick this end. We draw a line like this. Any, any direction doesn't really matter. And then what you do, make another line, which has the same, like you have to make sure that this angle I and this R is the same, okay? It, uh, does it look same to you? I don't think so, it's the same, right? I think the other line is bigger. I'm going to move it a bit. Yep, like this. So it's going to be like that. All right. Okay, and then make arrow like this and like that. Now, it says mark uh, X the position of image of the clock. So, well, uh, what you do, extend this line. Let me show you. Keep it right on top. There is a way. Extend the line. And then this is just like, you know, make a line like this. So you see that it will be exactly behind the mirror and it's the same distance. So you can approximately do it or you can uh, just do it by this, right? So this should be the image. And then you can erase the lines. Like this. So basically it will be exactly the same distance and above. Um, okay, so we have to mark X, not, we don't have to draw the X. Now it says state whether the image found in the mirror is virtual and real. So it is uh, virtual. 
because it does not form on the screen. That's why. Show the image of the clock seen by boy. Draw what boy sees. So it's going to be horizontally flipped. This arm is going to be like this, and this arm is going to be like this. So you have to flip it horizontally, okay? Because mirrors cause lateral inversion. The clock is illuminated by source of mon monochromatic green light. Monochromatic. Mono means one. Chroma means frequency. Or wavelength, whatever you write. So we're going to write single wavelength. Or you could write frequency. It, ups, it, it is up to you. Okay, whatever you want to write. Wavelength, frequency. Uh, light okay then green light has a wavelength of this calculate the frequency is equal to f lambda green light is uh, in electromagnetic spectrum so speed has to be this and frequency and this wavelength so what you do calculate it so 3.0 times 10 is to power 8 you divide it by 5.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 7. Like that. Oh my God. So, no. This calculate, I'm not happy with. Oh, I didn't find scientific notation. Okay. So, 5.4 times 10 raised to about 14 hertz is the answer to this. All right. Oh, by the way, right. Hertz. Or you won't get the marks. Now, now say sketch the pattern of direction magnetic field. So you have to make at least four lines, equally spaced and straight. At the ends, they can you know curve a little. Take your time with it. Don't rush. Just make equally spaced lines. Always not to south. Then show the bar magnet with the coil. Name the parts labeled as A. Slip rings. We did it the other day, you know? The coil of Y is rotated in the direction shown. Okay, fine. Draw an arrow to show the direction of current in the coil. Explain your answer. Now, first of all, if this is turning like this, this means force here will be on top, force here will be down. Now, I told you this is a generator. So generator, what we use? We use right and lemmings rule, right? So what you do? Your index finger is not to south. So this is your index finger, right? So like this, this is your index finger. Now, are we talking about say this wire right now this wire. so your thumb is upwards this is your thumb so you will notice that your middle finger is here this means that the current is going in and from here the current will come out okay so we will say draw the direction so we have drawn the direction which is great you can drop this off you don't need this and then you say, explain your work. So you say, the current direction can be found using Fleming's left hand rule. And so now you might be confused, why am I writing Fleming's left hand rule? And I'm not saying Fleming's right hand rule. Because in reality, there's no Fleming's right hand rule. It is just a tool we use to find it quickly. Asal mein, there is only left hand rule, but we have to apply Lenz's law with a combination of this, right? So, 
Uh, you you always write it is uh, Fleming's left hand R rule. Okay, don't write right hand. There is no such thing. It is just a uh, uh, say thing we use to quickly find it. Uh, the current direction in a generator because it is always opposite to what left hand shows. All right, that's one. Explain how rotating coil con continuously causes galvanometer needle to show an alternate current. Now, what you do? You say, as the coil is continuously rotated, it cuts the magnetic field. All right. Second point. This causes a change in magnetic flux that induces EMF. Third point. Okay. So basically, you can take more space uh, by writing it like together, but that's fine. The direction of current. So we have to write Lenz's law as well. Okay, so two points for Faraday's, two points for Lenz's. Direction current is such that to oppose the change causing it fourth point. Hence, every half turn, it switches or reverses, you can write reverses, better word by the reverses its direction. So alternating current is induced. Like that. Okay, so these are two for Farad writing uh, Faraday law and two for writing lenses long. Okay. okay. Now, if you have any questions, please let me know. Yes. So this is like, yes. For the above question, can I elaborate by saying that force is, is upwards and field goes from north to south? Yes, you can always say that. And using them, yes, that's true. But then you have to uh, also say that the force is upwards on the coil on the left and force is downwards on the coil to the right, okay? Whatever you're looking at, make sure you mention it because they're both of them there, right? We don't want the examiner to be confused. That's why I need to drink some water. Hmm. Then shows a circuit including 12 volts battery in two identical lamps. The 12 volt battery consists of cells containing in series. Each cell in the battery has electromotive force of 1.5. Determine how many cells are there. So basically, when it's in series, uh, you can add 1.5, right? So there are 12. So if one cell is equal to 1.5 volts, how many cells are going to be in 12 volts? So you cross multiply. So number of cells will be 12 divided by 1.5 volts, okay? So 12 divided by 1.5, eight cells. Now, when switch is closed, the ammeter reading is two. Calculate the resistance in the circuit. Okay, so we're going to use V equals to IR. Total voltage is 12, the total current is 2.4. We can find the total resistance just like that. So it is five ohms. Units are essential. Each lamp has a resistance of three ohm. Okay, so this guy here has three ohm. This guy here has also three ohm. Calculate the resistance of Q. Now, if you look at it, these are parallel, right? So First of all, let's find out the total resistance here. So one upon three plus one upon three equals to one upon R. So one upon R is equal to two upon three. So R is three upon two, which is just 1.5. Now, and then you see the total resistance 
is equal to 1.5 ohm plus Q because this is in series with this. So total resistance was 5, 5 minus 1.5 is equal to Q. So that is 3.5 ohms. That's just like that. Okay. Draw a voltmeter. So across two lamps. So it means we just need to let's erase the platter. You just need to draw a voltmeter connected to uh, connected in parallel with any lamp. So that would give you the voltage. Okay. Now. Calculate the power supplied to one lamp. All right. So we got this three. Now check this out. It's very easy. Both of them have the same resistance, right? Same resistance is pretty easy because then the current gets divided equally. So when the current was flowing, it was 2.4 ampere. So this means this, this will get 1.2 ampere. This will get 1.2 ampere as well. So it's equally divided if they're not, if they're the same. Okay. So then what you do, you say power equals to I squared R. It is 1.2 whole squared. And the current and the, uh, the resistance was three. So 1.2 squared times three. So that's 4.32 volt, just like that. If you have any questions, please let me know. Right. Now it says a radio is connected to main supply using a step down transformer. Draw a label diagram structure of basic step down transformer. So you make a box and then you make a, this is the iron core. Now we are stepping it down. Step down means that less voltage will be there. So you have to make more turns on the primary side. So there's an alternating current. So we're going to try it. Primary voltage. And then you have to make less number of turns on the secondary side. So you can you can actually put anything there like voltmeter or whatever. So that's secondary. Now, explain the basic operation of basic transformer. So how it works, right? So, at, so three marks as the current. Those through primary coil. It produces magnetic field into the core. Oh, by the way, it has to be labeled right. It says labeled iron core, uh, secondary coil, and primary coil. All right, so it induces magnetic field into the core. The alternating current changes direction every now and then, which causes a change in magnetic field in secondary coil, okay? Change in magnetic flux in secondary coil. Hence, EMF is induced. So that's what you want to write, all right? Now, 
So you see, it's so like every time parity laws is going to be there, it has the same statements. You just need to, you know, change uh, some word like it is a secondary coil or primary coil or something else. It's the same statement all over again. That's why it is super easy. Okay. Now, a voltage main supply is 230. Okay, thanks for telling us. And the output of the transformer is six volts. Okay, perfect. And calculate the value of NS over NP. Give your answer in two significant terms. Let's do it. NS over NP is equal to VS over VP. So the VS is six, VP is 230. So six divided by 230. It's 0 0.026. That ratio has, uh, if ratio of same quantities are there, like uh, they're the same units, really. So you don't have to, you know, and uh, they don't have any units. So. That's fine. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. And the answer is in two significant figures. Now, show the digital circuit. What is meant by digital? Digital means that input and output in zeros and ones. So you can also write signals, right? Signal in zeros and ones. Now, so this is shown. A and B, it is an AND, and then there is a C. So AND produces zero for zero, zero for zero, zero one is also zero, one zero is zero, one one is one, and then there is a NOT, so it would flip it. Right. Sometimes you also want to write that you can also write as uh, it is a signal of highs and lows, but that's fine. All right. State the single logic gate that would produce the same output D from uh, A and B. So that would be NAND. Basically, this is NAND. This different uh, the connector like this. Now, the isotope americium, americium two forty one is represented by. So alpha is four and two. This is going to be 237. And this is going to be 93. So you have to balance this, right? And you should know what is alpha. So there is a detector circuit, radioactive source, metal plates. Okay, airflow. What is happening in this? How the americium ionizes uh, air. Okay. So americium americium 241 decays with alpha particle. As we know uh, from the top. Alpha particle has a plus two charge and is highly ionizing. Hence, it can take two electrons from air to ionize it. Okay. Now, 
lives. Then suggest explain two reasons why smoke detectors used in isotope that emits alpha particle rather than isotope that emits gamma. One of the reasons this is that uh, alpha particles have very short range. So they do not affect the humans around the detector. Okay, so that's one thing. And then alpha particles can easily ionize the smoke particles in air, which can sound the alarm. Unlike gamma. Okay, like that. And that's it. Yay. If you have any questions, please let me know.